So the climate scientists are telling us that the world is warming and it's all down to us and that warming will cause destabilisation within a couple of decades if we don't act fast. The United Nations and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are telling us we've got to close all the coal mines, shut down all the gas pipelines, decommission all the oil platforms, stop fracking and build huge machines to suck carbon dioxide out of the air. And technologists are telling us that we've got to completely re-engineer the entire energy infrastructure that provides power and heat for our homes, schools, factories and offices so that it all runs on renewable energy sources that don't contain any fossil fuels at all. And they're all telling us that we've got to do all that in the next 11 years. So if you're not a multi-millionaire and you have to go to work every day to pay your bills and support your home and family, you might find you're asking yourself a couple of important questions. Number one, is my livelihood at risk as millions of skilled trades and support workers get made redundant from the fossil fuel industries? And number two, how much are all these infrastructure changes going to cost and where's all that money coming from? Well, on the 27th of June this year, a new report was published in America by global energy consultants Wood Mackenzie. They propose solutions to these problems, but will they work? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Wood Mackenzie are affectionately known as Wood Mac. And they're a very well established and very well respected energy consultancy company based in Edinburgh in Scotland. You can read all about their history and credentials at this Wikipedia page. And you can download this PDF version from their website for free or you can go online and have a look at their interactive version. The interactive version is extremely user friendly which makes it very easy for me to show you a summary of their findings. So here goes. Well, they certainly start with a headline grabber. Wood Mackenzie estimates full decarbonisation of the US power grid at 4.5 trillion US dollars, given the current state of technology, nearly as much as what the country has spent since 2001 on the war on terror. From a budgetary perspective, the cost is staggering at 35,000 US dollars per household. That equates to nearly 2,000 US dollars per year if assuming a 20 year plan. So how do Woodmac arrive at their overall cost of 4.5 trillion? Well, first of all, they educate us on the difference between what's called levelised cost of electricity versus the overall price of transitioning to 100% renewables. Levelised cost, they tell us, is the cost per unit of building and operating a new generation asset. By contrast, the total price associated with transitioning to renewables is more akin to the impact on customer rates assuming ratepayers ultimately foot the bill. That's actually a challengeable assumption, by the way, but we'll come back to that later. In the meantime, here's how those two cost elements have historically stacked up in California. The levelised costs of wind and solar, which is the blue and orange lines, have dropped dramatically over eight years as setup costs have been amortised and the real price of turbines and panels has plummeted due to much better material and production efficiency combined with higher volume of throughput. But the cost of building and operating generation facilities, making capacity payments, investing in transmission and distribution infrastructure, delivering customer facing grid edge technology, and of course delivering a profit for shareholders, has all been passed on to the end user. So the average Joe has actually seen an increase in their utility bills of over 20%. The American power grid currently has 1,060 gigawatts of capacity of which about 130 gigawatts currently comes from wind and solar. Woodmac estimates that to get to 100% renewable energy by 2030 would require about 1600 gigawatts of new wind and solar energy. That's assuming we only use solar and wind to replace fossil fuels of course, but let's carry on with their figures anyway. So to get from 130 gigawatts to 1600 gigawatts, say Woodmac, the US would need to install more solar and wind capacity every single year between now and 2030 than the entire cumulative solar and wind capacity that's been installed since the turn of this century. And they estimate that represents a cost of roughly $1.5 trillion. So what is it that accounts for the other $3 trillion in their overall $4.5 trillion estimate? Well, as you've probably already guessed, it's energy storage. Wind and solar are sporadic, we all know that, it's a simple physical fact. So you need to store excess energy when you're generating more than you immediately need, and that stored energy needs to be made instantly available when there's a generation deficit, like at night time 
or when the wind isn't blowing or during the long dark winter months. Woodmark reckons the United States will need 900 gigawatts of new energy storage to achieve stability and supply security. They tell us that right now there's only 5.5 gigawatts of battery storage in operation in the entire world. According to Woodmac, implementing this extra storage capacity at a national grid level will add another 2.5 trillion to the bill, taking us to $4 trillion so far. Woodmac then add to this the cost of extra high voltage transmission lines and other ancillary infrastructure to reach this conclusion. Excluding supply chain impacts and other items such as stranded costs, an investment of 4.5 trillion US dollars would be required to fully transition the US power grid to renewables over the next 10 to 20 years. That implies an investment of roughly 225 to 450 billion dollars a year, a scale comparable to the total US defense budget. Further underlying the scale of this endeavor, the International Energy Agency estimates global power sector spending averaged $675 billion from 2007 to 2017. Quite a daunting task, isn't it? So Woodmac recommend that we don't do it. Instead, they offer us this rather more gentle and civilized glide path, one that's a bit more palatable with apple pie on a Sunday. Number one, allow more time for new technologies to be commercialized. Their argument being that the longer a technology exists, the cheaper it gets, and they point towards various emerging technologies as examples. Number two, extend the horizons to 2040 or 2050. After all, they say, two leading renewable energy pioneers, California and Germany, have targets of only 60% and 65% renewable energy by 2030. Number three, allow for zero carbon technologies, by which they basically mean nuclear power. Number four, reduce the mandate from 100% to 80%, allowing 20% of the energy to still come from gas-fired power stations. That's better, isn't it? Much less scary. Now we can all avoid that horrible $35,000 per household hit that Woodmac threatened us with at the start of their report, right? But what if we don't do that? What if we stick to the 2030 plan and find the money? And what if, God forbid, we gently suggest that the average Joe should not be the one to shoulder the financial burden of this historic revolutionary transition? Now, if you're a US resident, you might possibly have noticed that just by pure coincidence of timing, in the very same week that Woodmac released their report, the Democratic Party conducted a couple of quiet little debates to try to choose a presidential candidate for the 2020 general election. One of those candidates is the seasoned campaigner and independent senator for Vermont, Bernie Sanders. One of Bernie's headline policies is to wipe clean all the debts accumulated through student loans in the US, a number, by the way, that has risen from $480 billion in 2006 to $1.6 trillion today. The proposal is to apply an almost negligible tax to all stock market transactions. The market capitalization of the companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange was over $30 trillion as of February 2018, and hundreds of billions of dollars change hands in the market every single day. The tax structure would look like this. One half of 1% tax on all general stock trades, one tenth of 1% tax on all bond trades, and a two hundredth of 1%, that's 0.005%, on all derivatives trades. Barely noticeable to the uber-rich money men, something akin to a rounding error in their prodigious financial spreadsheets. But nevertheless, this level of tax would raise $2.4 trillion over 10 years. I'm not making this point for any political reasons. I'm not a US citizen, so I'm not presenting it in order to promote Bernie's idea, except to say that just from a logical point of view, it does seem like the debt lifted from the 45 million people in America affected by these student loans would probably just go straight back into the economy by dint of those people spending more money on goods and services. But anyway, it's not my place or my intention to wade into American domestic politics. I simply use the example because it neatly illustrates the astonishing numbers that go through Wall Street on a yearly basis and how relatively painless it would be to generate the subsidies to facilitate all the infrastructure works that would Mac tell us the United States will need without necessarily inflicting swinging tax increases on US families 
or applying huge price increases to utility bills. And of course, the Herculean task of root and branch transformation of the US energy infrastructure system means solid, secure and well paid work for millions of people, many of whom will probably find they can quite easily transition their skill sets across from the fossil fuel industries. But just to give ourselves a fully rounded picture, let's tackle the financial challenge from the opposite direction. How much will it cost if we don't make the changes? In his recent book, The Uninhabitable Earth, David Wallace Wells draws on a 2015 report by Marshall Burke, Solomon Siang and Edward Miguel. The report states, using our benchmark model, climate change reduces projected global output by 23% in 2100 relative to a world without climate change. Wallace Wells adds some more commentary to put that percentage number into a dollar figure. Should the planet warm 3.7 degrees Celsius, one assessment suggests, climate change damages could total $551 trillion, nearly twice as much wealth as exists in the world today. And by the way, we are still tracking globally on what the IPCC call their RCP 8.5 scenario, which means we're still firmly on course for a global temperature increase of between 3.2 and 5.4 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. According to the World Bank, without urgent action, climate change impacts could push an additional 100 million people into poverty by 2030, and 17 million of them will be in Latin America. And I wonder where they'll try to move to in their existential desperation. And Mr. Trump tells us he doesn't believe in climate change. He knows. And then there's AIG, one of the world's largest insurance companies. They are hard-hearted, stone-cold pragmatists. They only look at numbers. Their latest industry report says this. There is increasing scientific evidence supporting the premise that extreme weather events are increasing in frequency and intensity and will only grow more pronounced in the foreseeable future. This upward trend is of particular concern for North America, which has seen a disproportionate increase in the number of extreme weather events. In January of this year, Pacific Gas and Electric filed for bankruptcy protection after some of its power lines caused forest fires in California. That company is now being cited by big commercial banks as the first example of a large company that did not build sufficient climate risk and cost mitigation into their business model and failed as a result. Those commercial banks are now rapidly changing their own risk models and the PG&E example has been a real wake-up call for the financial service industry. In 2017, just the cost of extreme weather events alone impacted the US economy to the tune of $312 billion. Last year was comparatively quiet, only costing $90 billion. But that compares to a 1980 to 2018 average of just $43 billion. And just now, we're only at one degree Celsius of warming. According to NOAA, the top five US coastal regions with insured seafront properties vulnerable to hurricanes and New York, with $2.92 trillion worth at 2019 prices, followed by Florida with $2.86 trillion worth, Texas with $1.17 trillion worth, Massachusetts with $849 billion worth, and New Jersey with $713 billion worth. According to another new report from Resilient Analytics and the Center for Climate Integrity, the state of Florida alone could be on the hook for building $76 billion worth of seawalls by 2040 to mitigate the effects of climate change, and that's based on a conservative sea level rise scenario. To put that in perspective, Florida's entire 2018 budget was about $88.7 billion. The executive director for the Center for Climate Integrity, Richard Wiles, said, as a nation and as a global community, due to climate change, we are set to undertake the most dramatic economic and social transformation in human history. In the face of these stark realities, being reported by the very organisations whose business it is to ensure they don't get economically caught out by the consequences of unexpected risk, it could be argued that the gentle glide path and slower implementation of renewable technologies being espoused by Wood Mackenzie might actually prove to be more costly and more dangerous in the long run. Should we tax Wall Street? 
would Wall Street accept any impact on the monopolistic power the ultra-rich have over our society? I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions, especially if you're a US citizen, and I look forward to reading your views in the comments section below. That's it for this week though. Please do give us a like and a share if you found the program useful and informative. And if you haven't already done so, please also subscribe to the channel and remember to hit the little bell so that you get notified when new content comes out each week. Subscribing's dead easy and free to do. Just click on that link there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.